welcome to our viral church for this the fourth Sunday in Easter. It's good to be able to be with you here again. Today we're going to be thinking about what it means when Jesus describes himself as the Good Shepherd. What is a Good Shepherd? What does a Good Shepherd do? And how does that make a difference to us as Christians? So we're going to be thinking about that as the service goes along. But first we're going to begin by coming to God in prayer. So let us pray. Lord God, creator of all that is, this world is yours, planned in eternity, created in a moment of sheer exuberance permeated with love, it is well made. This place is yours, in its simplicity, blue sky and countryside, pure creativity painted with care, it is well made. This day is yours, pure generosity given for moments of gentle reflection in the bustle of a day. It is well made. This moment is yours, in all its entirety, a drop of time in an ocean of history, gifted with joy. It is well made. As we gather, help us to find you in this place, in this space, because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we join our prayers together as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. It's a strange time at the moment. For some, a time of hardship. For some, it's a, a scary time. And sometimes I think as Christians we feel that we shouldn't be scared. We've got God to look after us. What's there to be scared about? But actually it's okay to be scared. I want to introduce you to a new friend, Douglas. I want to thank the people at douglastalks.com for making this video that you're going to watch now available to us to use for free. It's a very generous offer. So please feel free to show it to anyone you think it will help. It's particularly aimed at children, but I think there's something in there for all of us. And so Douglas is going to talk to us about being scared. Hey guys, it's me again, Douglas. And today I wanted to talk to you about something kind of kind of scary going on in my life right now. And maybe by the time you're watching this, you know, everything has gone back to normal. But no matter what you're going through, I feel like there are lots of things that can be kind of big and scary. So like for me right now, the thing I'm kind of dealing with is there's this big virus going around and it's kind of a big deal. But yeah, like they've closed all kinds of stuff because of this virus. Like they closed school maybe for the whole rest of the school year which at first I was really excited about. I was like, yeah, no school. How cool is that? 
but they're also closing all kinds of stuff. You know, the restaurants and they're closing sporting events and, and, and they're even canceling churches. We're having to do church online. And they're saying, don't go visit your friends and especially don't go visit your grandparents. And, and it's got me, it's got me kind of scared. And if you are also a little bit worried or a little bit scared, I want you to know that that is okay. It's okay to be a little bit scared. But you know what else? God wants us to be brave. He does. And you might be saying, well, Douglas, you can't be brave and scared at the same time. Well, actually, I think you can't be brave unless you are scared. You know, when there are scary things going on, there are really three ways that you can react to them. One way to react is just to be super duper mega scared and you let that fear take over your life and nothing is happening but that fear and you're not going to do what God has called you to do. You're not going to do anything but run away and scream or, you know, buy a whole bunch of toilet paper. I don't know. And that is not the right response for when things are scary. I believe that when God says not to be afraid, he's talking about that kind of stuff. Don't let fear control your life. But then there's another reaction where people will you know, in scary times, they'll just pretend that nothing scary is happening at all. And I feel like that is pretty foolish. Being brave isn't pretending that nothing is wrong. Being brave is doing what you need to do, even when it's scary. You know, I really like the story of David and Goliath to, to kind of explain what it means to be brave, even when things are scary. Because all of the Israelites besides David, every single one of them was too afraid to go fight Goliath. But you know what? Somebody had to fight Goliath. And David was brave and decided that he would go fight Goliath. But he was also smart about it. You know, I don't know that anybody could say that David did not have enough faith, right? He was a kid. He was a kid and he decided that he would go fight Goliath if everyone else was too afraid to. And he knew that he could win because he knew that God was on his side. And it is absolutely the case that God won the victory that day. It was only because of God that David was able to win. But David still had to fight Goliath. When the king offered David his armor, David said, no, I can't fight in that. That armor is way too big for me. And it only took one stone to bring down Goliath. But David went and picked out several. Not because he didn't have faith, but because he was being smart. For David, the smart thing to do in the situation he was in was to prepare for a fight knowing that he could win with God's help. And for me, the smart thing for me to do in this whole virus thing is to stay home, spend more time with my family, and more time with God. That's really been one of the cool things about this whole scary deal is is I, I've got more time at home. It's been kind of nice, actually. You know, I've always thought it's interesting because a lot of the times when an angel shows up in the Bible, it says, do not be afraid, or be not afraid, or however your Bible translates it. But it's always doing something scary. You know, you might be in a room by yourself and then an angel just goes, boom, be not afraid. And it might be, you know, really bright and and scary looking. But I think angels can look like what they want to look like. And so I've always wondered why, you know, the angels in the Bible don't just always look like a normal person to not scare people. Right? Because we know there are times in the Bible where, you know, it says that that maybe you've met an angel before and you just didn't recognize them because they, they just decided to look like a person. You know, why didn't the angel just look like a normal person, go knock on the door, and say, oh, hey Mary, I'm an angel sent from God. Do you have a minute to talk? Why didn't they do that? If God doesn't want us to be afraid, why were the angels scary? I think that those angels were scary to show the seriousness of the situation. I don't think that when the angels said, don't be afraid, that they were saying, it's wrong for you to be afraid of me. I think that what they were saying was, I know that I'm scary looking, but I need you to be brave and pay attention because what I'm about to say is really important. So yeah, if you're going through a scary situation right now like I am, I don't think that God wants us to pretend that it's not scary. You know, I know that God's in control. And because of that, I know that everything's going to be okay. But it's still kind of a scary situation. And that's all right. I can be brave and do the things that I'm supposed to do. Which for me is pretty simple. I just got to stay home. God wants us to be brave and to be wise. And to rest knowing that he is in control. Everything is going to be okay. So as Douglas says, it's okay to be scared. 
but we also remember that we've got God who cares for us. And so we're going to hear our reading now, which is read for us by Zara, who is a member at Shackles Off. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that he entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of the strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were, which he spake unto them. Then Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door, by me if any man in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. The use of pastoral symbols in the Gospels uh, is quite common. The idea of the shepherd and his sheep, Jesus describing himself as the good shepherd, or in this particular passage as, as the gate for the sheep, were all sort of quite common images as we read through the Gospel story. And that makes a lot of sense because Jesus was living in a, a broadly pastoral society. The images that he used would have been very familiar. The people would have made a connection and understood what he was talking about. But how do we interpret and understand the pastoral images in a broadly non-pastoral society today? I suppose the question is, what is a good shepherd? What's the difference between a good one and a bad one? I suppose in this area we're perhaps a little bit more familiar with the pastoral images in as much as it's difficult to go a walk around here without catching at least a distant glance uh, of sheep on a hillside somewhere. And across the circuit we do have some people who are involved in the, in the sheep farming industry. And it was interesting, uh, a few weeks ago before the lockdown, uh, I was talking to uh, Thomas Trafford at Bassenthwaite about the upcoming lambing season and what it meant for him. And he was telling me how for probably about six weeks he'll be sleeping on his settee, getting up in the night just to check on, the, uh, on his flock, just to make sure that they're okay. He cares about his sheep and so he makes sure he looks after them even when it means putting himself out. And I suppose that's what a good shepherd does. In a way, it's a bit like what any good leader does. They put themselves before those that they are leading. 
But what is their goal? What is their aim? This passage finishes with one of my favourite quotes of Jesus from the whole of Scripture. I came that you might have life and have it in all its fullness. You see, a good leader doesn't just care about survival. They care about quality of life. Jesus doesn't want us to survive. He wants us to thrive. He wants us to have the best life that we can have. And what he's saying uh, in this parable is that the best life that we can have is the one that we will find in him. John tells us that Jesus was part of creation, that in the beginning he was there and that nothing was made without him. He is intimately bound up in the whole of creation and in the creation of humanity. And as the creator, surely he knows better than anyone else what we are capable of, what is the best life that we can have. And he offers to help us to achieve that by trusting in him, by following him, by being led by him. Because only then will we reach our full potential. Only then will I be the best Paul that I can possibly be. Jesus doesn't make empty promises. And this is what my favourite promise, that he will help me to be the best person that I can be. That he will help all of us to achieve our true potential if we will just look to him, trust in him and follow him. Amen. shepherd I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust in you.
the comfort I need to know, and I will trust in you alone, and I will trust in you As the world faces up to the widespread disruption to life being caused by the coronavirus pandemic, let us ask for God's help in what lies ahead. Let us pray for all those who are working to control the spread of the virus. May they be encouraged by the knowledge that their efforts are appreciated by us all. Let us pray for all those in the medical profession who are tasked with caring for those who have the virus. For the hospital staff carrying out the testing. For the ambulance crews transporting patients to hospitals. And for the doctors and nurses who are treating those seriously in need. Let us pray for those involved in local and national governments, tasked with the job of ensuring that financial and physical assistance is in place where it is most needed. We pray also that those from whom they seek medical advice may be guided into making decisions for the good of all. Let us pray for our own local community, that those in the greatest need are helped and supported in a caring and neighbourly way. Let us pray for all those who have lost their lives as a result of the virus. We remember the families that they have left behind and the communities in which they lived. We offer these our prayers in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for being here with us today. I hope that you have found this service a blessing. It has certainly been a joy and a blessing for me to make the service and put it together. And so we ask God's blessing on us as we go. May the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love, now and always. Amen.